Hey, Year 11s. Thanks so much for coming. I really hope that you guys are doing okay and everyone is well, considering the trauma that's going on around Malaysia. Today, we're going to be looking at a review of the worksheet that I've given you guys that I've set on the classroom, and then I'm going to be doing a quick revision session on energetics. I'm going to be looking at energetics specifically from a question standpoint. I'm going to use that as a jump off point to be able to talk about the topic. Uh, I'm going to get straight into it since I've been having technical difficulties over the last couple of days. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to get straight into it and then go from there. I'm also going to be trying a new trick today in order to try and in order to. So that should now be up and running. I'm just checking to see whether or not it's working on my other laptop or not. We will see. Uh, channel, let's see if I can figure this out. I don't think I'm going to be able to. I need to be able to see whether or not you guys can see me. Um, it should come up saying that I'm live and I'm having, as I said, slight difficulties. I'm also going to attempt, a, as I said, a new trick today because you guys should now be seeing my screen. Hello. Oh, it's nice to see you guys. Thanks for coming. Uh, can you guys hear me all okay? Is that is everything okay? Can you hear me? Kind of hoping that you can. Yes, you can. Phew, I like it. As I said, I'm going to try a new trick today. I'm going to try disabling. So what I'm, what I'm finding is happening, if I do disable, oh, disabling will cause it to stop functioning. Let's see if this works. Oh, right. I'm hoping that you guys can still hear me. Can you guys still hear me now? At this point, I can't seem to get my... Uh, <laughs> laptop giving me my actual video screen. Can you guys still hear me? Is that still working? Yes. Okay. Well, I'm kind of hoping it is. As I said, I can't seem to... Um... Oh, that might be why. I need to switch accounts. Uh, switch account. I go to... Ah, uh, that's why. Okay. Um, so I, I can't check. I think everything's still working, so I'm going to pretty much jump straight in now at this stage. Right, so I set you guys uh, an activity on the classroom. I'm really hoping that now that I've disabled my camera inside my computer settings, that it's going to give me a bit longer in terms of time-wise before my computer starts to go into a meltdown stage. But we will see. Okay, so I set you guys a quick homework. It was just revision, really, on, on atom structure and equations and mixtures. It was quite a nice revision sheet. I did realize that there was a, a picometer question in there that you guys wouldn't know, but let's have a look and see how we get on. So, okay, the first thing is, it was just to fill in the table. So, atom or ion, well, that's interesting. We're assuming, because of the particles given us potassium 19 and 41. That's interesting, because that's an isotope of potassium straight off the bat. I'm going to uh, also make sure I have a periodic table on hand. Uh, if I can track it down, there's a period. See, I know that that's, uh, see, since potassium's most common isotope is 39, I immediately recognize that as an isotope. So it is going to be an atom. It can't be an ion because we, we're going to make an assumption because there's no other data. We have to assume that the protons and neutrons, are to, uh, are the protons and electrons are the same. So we've got atomic number 19, mass number is 41, number of protons is 19, number of neutrons is 21. Uh, is it 22? 22. 22. Um, 41 minus everyone's wondering how I'm getting to that number. Well, considering the mass number is the P's, we know that the mass number is P's and N's, protons and neutrons, and the bottom number is just protons. I'm just minusing 19 from 41 to give me 22. Number of electrons is the same as the protons. Electronic structure is 2 comma 8 comma 8 comma 1 which adds up to 19. Now I'm people wonder how I'm doing that. I'm I'm actually reading the periodic table in my head. I'm not doing anything fancy there. Uh all I'm doing if I do if I do screenshot of that full screen snip what I can do is show you that I'm actually reading the table two there are two people in the first row followed by the second row, which contains two and six, which is eight, followed by the third row, which is two and six again, which is another eight, and then potassium there, which is only one in that row, so two comma eight comma two. Uh, going back to this. 
So it's quite nice to remind you guys of all these particular games that chemistry plays. Next one, number of protons. That's going to give us aluminium-13. It's interesting that the numbers are on the other side in this case. So that's aluminium-13. Then I've got the number of neutrons. So I'm going to add that together to get the top number. That's the atomic number, of course, is the same as the proton number. That's going to give us 27 in terms of a mass number. Uh, we're also going to get, is it an atom or ion? Right, number of electrons. The number of electrons is not the same as the number of protons, so it's definitely going to be an ion, and it's going to be a cation since it's lost three electrons. So that's going to be, going back to my periodic table again, so for aluminium, its normal routine would be 2, 8, 3, but then it's only got 10, so it's lost the, two outer, lost the three outer electrons. So that's just going to be 2, 8, giving us 10 electrons. Quite nice. You can see the game that is being played. The top number, of course, the mass number is 27 over there. Next one, total number of protons is 8, so this is going to be oxygen. The electrons, it's gained two, so it's an ion, and it's an oxygen eight. Uh, the number of neutrons is eight, so it's going to have a mass number of 16. The atomic number is eight, the atomic mass number is 16, and the electronic structure, well, considering it's protons, it's an ion, it's gained two extras. Let's go back to oxygen. So oxygen is two comma six usually, but then it's gained two, which means I'm going to have two comma eight. That, so it's going to be 2, 8. So there's the table filled out. Quite like that. The element potassium consists of two isotopes, 93% of this one, and the rest is okay. So they're doing us calculate the relative atomic mass. We know this question. They've also requested it to be in three significant figures. So we're going to do 93.3 multiplied by 39. The mass number is the only bit that's changing. You have nothing to do with the bottom number, with the proton number at this stage. It's just the uh, atomic mass. And we're going to add that to, right, we need to do 100. We're going to do 100 minus 93.3, which is going to give us 6.7, I think. I'm not going to do that in my head. I'd never do any calculation in my exa exam in my head. So I'm going to have 40, I'm going to have 6.7. 6.7 multiplied by 41. I'm going to divide that whole thing by 100, which, of course, is the total of the isotope. Because, because we're dealing in percentages here, we need to work out the averages. So I'm just going to be dividing it by 100%. So 93.3. I'm checking on my calculator as I'm typing it times 39 plus bracket 6.7 times 41. And I'm going to go, and then I'm going to divide that by 100, and I get a relative atomic mass of 39.1, and it's three significant figures, and that's my answer, 39.1. I like it. The diameter of a potassium atom, ah, oh, I've suddenly realized I have a problem here. I need, sorry, uh, I've suddenly realized that in order for me to use, I, don't, I can't remember. Uh, if I if I go, I, I suddenly realized I can't use the chat on the YouTube video if I haven't signed in. So I need to sign in. I'm having, sorry, slight difficulties here. I can't actually remember my password either. So I'll hopefully, I have no idea what this is going to be. Um... Try that. Nope. This is a problem. I apologize. Right, I've managed to get there, and I'm going to do, um, I'm assuming it should just come under, nope, none of that's there. Hang on one second. I do apologize, folks. You've just got to give me a little bit of time to get all this sorted. Uh, I do apologize. Uh, videos. Is that just going to tell me that I'm live? Live? Is that going to let me see that I'm broadcasting? Yes, it is. Winner! Oh, no, I just want to watch it. I don't want to see my statistics. Why are you showing me my statistics? I just want to watch it. Uh, nope, it's really not wanting to... Oh, oh, it's finally let me get there. Way! And this is going to come on loud now, isn't it? 
Oh, 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 scroll up. Ah, sorry, guys. Okay. Uh, that's amazing. So that's now up and running. I've got the chat back. So nice to see everyone. Wait, Mr. Duncan, can you scroll up a little bit, please? Yeah, of course. Is that okay there, Sian? Can you guys all hear me okay now? Hello. My chat, I think, is now working. I'm really hoping one of you guys is going to say hi again. So nice to see everybody this morning. Yes, thank you. Amazing. Okay, next. Right, so this is a really unusual question. And it, it do you know what? At Excel, it wouldn't really surprise me. Although I don't think they can ask you it in picometers. <laughs> the, the furthest they can go at Edexcel is going to be nanometers, which is 10 to the 9. So just a, a nanometer is 10 to the minus 9 meters, and a picometer is 10 to the minus 12. So the answer to that question is just 440 times 10 to the minus 12 meters is the answer to that one sorry about that one i thought it was really fascinating to see it appear i haven't seen a picometer translation in a while uh my a level students would be expected to be able to do that but definitely not a gcse uh, as i said nanometers could definitely appear uh, but pico wouldn't describe uh, by the way just to mention other bizarre um uh, other strange conversions that they tend to ask tons Edexcel really likes their tons, yet yeah, the ton, which is equal to 1,000 kilograms. The reason why they do this is when you're doing moles and you get the equation of number of moles as grams over rams, if you get given 2.3 tons, yes, the conversion is ridiculous because what you realize is that's two. that's 2,300 kilograms, which is the same as two. 0.3 million grams to give you the, the, the grams over rams. So just be aware of it. They do do it at Excel. Describe what you see when sodium burns in oxygen. You see a yellow flame and white smoke. You see a yellow flame and white smoke are the two observations there. Whenever you burn, so it's nice to mention this, are you going to convert it into standard form? Uh, are you saying that the picometers isn't actually in standard form? Because what I'd actually have to do is go 4.4 times 10 to the minus 10? Is that what you're really wanting me to do there, Sian? I don't, uh, and, and then there, that, that's, the, the answer is I don't think they'd really care. Do you know what? Be interesting to look at the mark scheme for that. Uh, I've got the mark scheme. The mark scheme is attached at the end. Um, it's actually on the... It's actually on the classroom for you guys. Uh, see if I can go to the mark scheme. Do they really care? Oh, yeah, they do. Well, at least that's what they wanted. It's nice to see that. Um, isn't, isn't that what the question wants? Yeah, but okay, fine. Yeah, all right. Mm, right. Adding in an extra level of difficulty, I guess. Um. Just to mention, if you burn any metal, if you burn any metal, now you see a yellow flame, but you could also see burns bright white. They will also allow that bright white, burns bright white. Because they all, any metal that burns will burn with a, with a white, with a bright, with a bright flame. Sodium tends to burn with a yellow flame color, although it is still very white. The only one that kind of stands out as being different is calcium. If you burn calcium, you genuinely get a bright red one. It's what's used in flares. Uh, but with sodium, it burns yellow. The white smoke, by the way, all metals produce white smoke. Um, this is, comes from periodicity. When you, burn, when you burn the metals in air, all of them, and it comes from magnesium mainly. If you want to look that up on YouTube, be, be, be more than welcome. Um, the white smoke, of course, is because you're forming magnesium oxide, which is an ionic solid, which means you form white smoke. It won't melt, so it comes off as white smoke. Uh, that's an ionic solid, of course, with a crazy high melting point. 2,400, crazy. Write a balanced equation for this reaction. Right, so sodium. Sodium plus, by the way, just to mention, you guys can just pretty much, unless they say the word word, <laughs> you're just you're ignoring word equation. You're just going for symbol. Yeah, and we're going to form Na2O. That's the important bit there, folks. Yeah. 
So, and then we need to balance it. Two sodiums, one sodium, two sodiums. So I'm gonna balance that there. But then the problem is, of course, I'm gonna get one oxygen. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do my half trick on the elements, and then I'm going to double everything. Yeah. So I'm actually gonna double the whole equation. Two there gives me two oxygens, and therefore two oxygens. But then, of course, my sodiums now become four. So there's the final answer. Next, sodium oxide is formed in this reaction. Explain why sodium oxide has a high melting point. Right, guys, we're dropping straight into bonding here. Yeah, so we're going to run a full Susan Boyle sings Nelly the Elephant. Susan Boyle sings Nelly the Elephant. So S stands for structure. Yeah, I think most people are probably going to be on this. So we're going to say that sodium oxide is a metal, non-metal. So we've got uh, Na2O is a giant ionic lattice. Giant ionic lattice. Next one, the bonds are the electrostatic, electrostatic attraction. I'm gonna go the full A level answer here, electrostatic attraction between, now at GCSE you're allowed to say oppositely charged ions, but at A level they've given me a compound, so I'm just gonna give those ions between Sodium, so between Na plus and O2 minus. So between sodium cations and oxide anions. Next, strength. The, this, these attractions, these attractions are super strong, are very strong. The number of them, millions of bonds millions of bonds because it's giant energy lots of energy needed to break all bonds lots of energy needed to break i should be shrinking my pen here lots of energy needed to break bonds that'd be easier to break all bonds i like it so we're just going to run susan boyle on that all the way even if it's only worth three marks or two marks we still run it you don't skip it you never know which one they want Potassium is more reactive than sodium. Explain why. Right, periodic table. I love my periodic table. So on this, we've got sodium and potassium are the ones that they're comparing. What we're realizing is that all metals, all, this is where I need to change my pen, all metals are trying to lose electrons. And we know... We know that so lithium has two shells. Why is it so thick? I don't want it size. Oh, there we go. It's a little bit better. Lithium has two shells. Oh, am I writing on the wrong thing there? Yes, I am. There we go. Lithium has two shells. Oh, and then my pen's fat again. <laughs> Let's shrink and shrink and shrink. Lithium has two shells and it's got one electron in its outer shell, which it's trying to lose. Sodium has three shells, so it's outermost electrons further from the nucleus. Potassium has four shells, outermost electron further from the nucleus, more easily lost. So we're gonna say sodium, sodium has three energy levels. Notice I drop to energy levels, uh, isn't, oh yeah, yeah, okay. Um, sodium has three energy. Notice how I switch immediately into exam questions for energy levels rather than shells. Sodium has three energy levels uh, compared compared to potassium having four. There's my four energy levels. There's my first mark. Energy levels. Then I'm going to say potassium. Potassium's outer electron is further, outer electron is further from nucleus, further from nucleus. If anyone's wondering why that matters, further from the nucleus, therefore more easily lost. If anyone's wondering, therefore more easily lost. Uh, if anybody's wondering why that's the case, more easily lost, therefore more reactive. Um, the reason being is because the electrons are only staying around the atom because the nucleus is positive. At the core of our atom is our nucleus, and our nucleus, of course, contains our positive protons. 
and neutral neutrons, well, the positive protons are what are going to hold our negative electrons in their shells. So that's the reason behind it. Now we know we've got sodium, uh, one more electron, there you go. There's sodium's configuration. Well, it has 11 protons at its core. It has 11 protons holding these electrons in place. And the outermost electron is only got two shells in between it. So it's going to be losing it because it's held that tightly. Whereas potassium, of course, has got that extra shell, which means it's further from the nucleus. It's going to be much easier, much, much more easily lost. Some people often argue that potassium has 19 protons. This is more A-level than GCSE. Two electrons, eight electrons. Well, what you get is what's called shielding. Um, and what you have to talk about here is what's called effective nuclear pull. And what you'll realize is in the first two shells of sodium, there are two electrons and eight electrons, which give it a total of 10. And those 10 electrons are going to cancel out 10 of those positive charges. So only 10, so only one proton effective pull, one proton effective on the outer. And the next one has got two, eight, and eight. That means that's going to be canceling out 18 of them which means I've got an effective pull of one again. Still only the effective, because these cancel out the others. It's called shielding. So it still has the same effective pull, but it's further from the nucleus. So that's actually why, if you actually want to have go for that extra understanding. Uh, and at this point, year 11, it's definitely worthwhile talking about that, but you can see the bullet points are fairly straightforward. Iron is a transition metal. Give three ways in which the transition metals are different to the ones in group one. What a great question. Love that. Very Edexcel, very IGCSE. Now, of course, what they're actually doing is simply asking you for the properties of the transition metals. Uh, also, the properties of group one. It's quite nice. So property number one is uh, group one metals, G1 metals float. And that's true for all of them. G1 metals float. All the transition metals don't. Transition metals don't, don't, do not float. That's pretty easy. Next, uh, group one metals are extremely reactive. Metals very reactive. And of course, very, re whoops, very reactive. And the transition metals aren't. TMs are not, are not very reactive. Next one, uh, group one metal compounds Group one metal compounds are all white. Compounds are all white, whereas the transition metal compounds have colors. TM compounds, T1 compounds are colored. Um, you could have also, if you'd preferred, you could have also added on a fourth one, which is group one metals are soft, TMs are not. TMs are hard and strong, are hard. You could have also said that group one metals um, have low melting points, low MPTs, whereas transition metals are high. So except for mercury, of course, which is a standout, standout one. But those are the five that they wanted. Next, chlorine is a gas at room temperature made of molecules. The boiling point of chlorine is minus 34. Give the formula of chlorine molecules, Cl2. I think everyone in this room is okay with that. Explain why chlorine has a low boiling point. So chlorine has a low boiling point. We're running Susan Boyle again, folks. Susan Boyle sings, no, I'm actually gonna move it over. It's just, I wanted to put it over there so they're all lined up, I'll do it there. Susan Boyle sings Nelly the elephant. Right, so we're gonna say the structure so the structure, so chlorine, chlorine is simple covalent. By the way, you can just say covalent there. If you don't use the word giant, they assume simple. Chlorine is simple covalent structure. Bonds, there are WIMPs. Now you're not allowed to write down WIMPs in your exam. So let's translate it out. Weak intermolecular molecular forces between the molecules. Between the molecules. Next, the strength of strength, 
strength of these is weak, is weak, is very weak, is very weak. The number, there are very few, there are very few of these forces. The energy to break is very low. To break very low. Cool. Next. So you realize, guys, you're just constantly doing this process of Susan Boyle. This idea of, you know, just applying this structure to these questions is so, so important. Do just continue to do so. Which one is more reactive? Oh, I love this. They've switched to the non-metal side instead of the metal side. So which is more reactive? So number one, chlorine is more reactive than bromine. Chlorine is more reactive. I'm actually just going to turn down my CPU. My laptop is very toasty right now. See if I can just reduce that down. It'll cool it a bit better. Chlorine is more reactive, more reactive than bromine. Right, let's explain why. That's because chlorine, of course, <clears throat> periodic table tells me. So we looked at the metals wanting to lose electrons. Wow, well, turn the CPU down. I know it's read slow. So let's now go to the non-metals. So we now know that the non-metals, the most reactive element in the universe is fluorine. Two shells, and it's try it's got seven electrons in its outer. It's trying to gain that, that eighth to fill its outer energy level. Chlorine, of course, has three shells, yeah, which means its outer energy level is further from the nucleus, which means it's going to be more difficult to gain the electron. Bromine has got four shells even further from the nucleus, even, even harder to gain that electron. So it's the same answer as the metals. We're just switching it to gaining them. Chlorine has three energy levels, has three energy levels. Bromine, bromine has four, four energy levels. First mark, right, um, bromine, bromine's um, outer energy level further from nucleus, outer energy level Further from nucleus, further from nuke, nucleus, so harder to gain, harder to gain electron. You're done. And you're finished. Next, complete the following equations. Write no reaction if there is no reaction. Right, so I'm going to put chlorine, I'm going to bubble, that's, that'd be an interesting thing to talk about. How would you actually do that practical? Well, chlorine, of course, is a gas, and fluor sodium chloride, it technically would be a solid, if, but you can't exactly react those two together, so we're going to do it as aqueous. I'm going to bubble chlorine gas, the picture for that would be, I've got a solution containing sodium fluoride ions, and sodium fluoride and aqueous, yeah, I'm going to bubble through, I'm going to bubble through gas and see if there's any reaction. And the answer is there's not going to be. We know that in reality, the chlorine is trying to steal the electron from fluorine. Fluorine is more reactive than chlorine. So chlorine is not going to be able to steal it from it. There is going to be no reaction here, no reaction. And the re explanation, so no reaction. I'm still checking to see whether or not people are on the chat. No reaction due to chlorine being less reactive. I know that's not asking for the explanation, but I feel like it's better chemistry to do so. Less reactive than fluorine, that's it. F. Next, potassium iodide. Ah, damn, now there's going to be a reaction. So the potassium makes no difference. That's a spectator ion. It's going to do nothing. I've got potassium and iodide, iodide ions. I'm going to bubble through bromine, Br2, 
And if we look on the periodic table, if we know one fact, fluorine is more reactive than anyone else in the known universe by a mile, by about, by about 10,000 times. She's crazy. Um, what I realize is that bromine is more reactive than iodine. So if bromine is going to steal, it's definitely going to happen. And this is going to be a redox reaction. Bromine becomes bromide and iodide becomes iodine. Let's balance the equation. There we go. So what's happening here on an atomic level is simply that the iodide, which is massive, by the way, iodide has that extra electron, which is there, making her iodide. Bromine comes along in a pair, doesn't want to be in a pair. Yeah, would much prefer to be on his own. Like this. And what happens is it, it's way more reactive. So this, the atom here of bromine will simply will break that bond and will steal, will steal the electron from iodine. So that electron here will get transferred over to that bromine atom, forming a bromide ion. And then the iodine is going to be left in a situation with only having its seven electrons. So it immediately pairs up with another iodine. So that's what's happening here. It is a redox in terms of redox wise, um, redox. So an oil rig, oxidation is the loss of electrons. Who's losing electrons? It's the iodide. So the iodide is losing electrons to the bromine. Reduction is the gain. Oil rig. Yeah, oil rig. Reduction is gain. Who's gaining is the bromine. It's nice just to, uh, just to mention that in terms of redox. Let's go back to the questions. If my laptop will let me. <laughs> there we go. So in this case, there will be, react there will be a reaction. Complete the following equation. So I'm going to form potassium word equation. Just swap them, swap the swap the non-metals here. You can swap the metal if you like, either one. Potassium bromide and iodine. And iodine. The iodide changes from ide to ene. Don't forget. Easy thing to miss there. Next. Dmitry Mendeleev is known as the father of the periodic table. What did what did Mendeleev do in terms of the periodic table, and why were his ideas accepted? That's a really good question. So what did he do? Mendeleev was an amazing man, and he was the one that gave me this. I'm sure what I'm tempted to do. I'm tempted to show you his table, because his table actually shows you exactly what he did. Do you want to see? It's a cool thing. Dimitri's original table. Now, just to mention, by the way, at this point, uh, I'm going to put uh, Mendeleev uh, periodic table. Mendeleev. Get rid of that. All right, and then go images. Because his original table, by the way, is not what you're seeing today. You're seeing an evolution of his original table. Uh, here is, there's his original table. Mendeleev was the man. He, he was the bomb of chemistry is what he was. He was amazing. No, I didn't click on you. I'm looking for his original one. Give me his original. What are you doing? There it is. Number one is you'll notice the table is actually sideways. They, yeah, they've, they've rotated it 90 degrees. You can see the, the, the periods. The periods, of course, I'm going to see if I find a full screen snip here. I'll be able to draw on this to show you what's going on here. Uh, do you know what? It doesn't matter. But what you can see is there are key... Actually, yeah, no, I still want to snip it. I want to snip it so I can show you stuff. Because Dimitri did some really awesome things. And the main thing is... Uh, let's go full screen. Snip! Right, come on. Come on, little computer. I know you're struggling a little bit. Let's see if, if I speed you up. Maybe uh, the problem is if I speed you up, then I'm going to end up... I wonder about a bit of a hissy fit, aren't they? There we go, getting ready. Dimitri was the man. And the reason why he was the man was number one. Look at that. He predicted elements. No one had ever done this before. This was really cool. Like he left gaps for people. That there is gallium and the other one is germanium. 
I mean, that was amazing. The guy was a hero. That's Gallium and that's Germanium. By the way, do you know what he called these guys? He called them, oh no, um, because it was based on, it was, this is, by the way, do you notice that here's the periods? Yeah, these are the periods. The whole table's been rotated. I don't know if I can actually rotate this. Uh, can I rotate this? I have no idea. Uh, I'm going to say no. It's going to freak me out if I try and do that. Uh, yeah, the whole table's been rotated. Won't let me rotate it. Um, but they were in the same group as carbon, or at least that one was, and then the same group as aluminium. And he called them something like e Eka Silicon. That's what he called it. He called this Eka Silicon. And he called this one Eka Aluminium. He actually gave them, it was really cool that. I mean, so the was he left gaps. Uh, just going to check and see what the people. Uh, oh, I've got some questions appearing. Uh, Mr. Duncan, Mel and I made a video on Dimitri and the period of table. Uh, with one of our friends. It was so good. Oh my God, we did. Uh, did we show you? I think you did. Can you Could you post it on the classroom? Didn't we leave blanks for undiscovered elements? Yes, you did. I'm sure he predicted their properties too. Uh, can you share it on the classroom, Mel and Sian? That would be amazing. I'd love that. Um, but hang on a minute. There's more to this, guys. We need to give more information here. So the first thing is, we need to say that he left gaps. He left gaps for undiscovered, undiscovered elements, undiscovered elements. The next thing is he did another key thing. Let's go back to my image. I, I love Dimitri. Dimitri is one of my heroes. <laughs> it's just amazing. Um, uh, the next thing is uh, I need to find now. The problem is me working sideways. I've turned to my laptop. I need to turn my laptop. Uh, see if I can find it. Where's to, um Iodine, uh, it's really hard working sideways. Uh, if I do that, group seven. And then it's also in another weird way as well. Oh, look, there we are. Uh, yeah, look, yeah, look there. Because number one is he put a J. He didn't know what to call Iodine, so he had a J originally. I think that actually had an original name. I don't know what uh, Iodine's original name was, but you'll notice that here's group seven, yeah? Not only is it turned sideways, but it's also flipped over as well. What a nightmare. But he did something really cool. Notice, look what's happening to the numbers. As you move down here, the numbers are increasing. And then suddenly he does something really clever with the last two numbers. Iodine and tellurium. He reversed them. He did something super special. No one had ever done this. He broke one of the cardinal rules set by other scientists, which was the periodic table should be in order of mass number. And he ignored it. He, he swapped. He swapped iodine and tellurium. Tellurium. I, I'm actually going to do them properly. Iodine and tellur, tellurium. 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 Uh, tellurium. Um, due to properties. So he did something super due to properties. He wanted the properties of group seven to line up and he ignored the mass. That was amazing. Like what a hero. No one else had ever done this. Super cool. Uh, the next thing, so those are, by the way, those were his major two things. He did have other things as well, uh, like predicting properties of the elements, but those were the two m m most noticeable parts for the other scientists. Uh, why were his ideas accepted? Do any of you guys know that? I've uh, I'll upload onto the class after. Thank you so much, Sian. You're such a star. Um, does anyone know why his his ideas were accepted? Two reasons. Why why would you accept? Why would you accept somebody's ideas? Why would you? Why would you do that? And don't overthink it. Just. Consider this as if, if someone came up to you, we're in, a, he was a scientist. Thank you, Emmeline. He wasn't just a scientist. He was Russia's, one of Russia's best chemists. Yeah. Uh, he was, he was noted a renowned, 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 renowned chemist. Renowned, renowned, I can't spell that. He was a famous chemist. Famous chemist. Yeah, famous scientist, famous chemist. Yeah, uh, 
so his, his, there was a second reason renowned thank you Mel. <laughs> uh next heisenberg what uh, anyway uh, he was a famous chemist stroke scientist i'm gonna put scientist um and also his ideas also miss mr duncan d j h s b d j i have no idea what that is have i gone mad <laughs> show oh is this like show or hide show i don't know what this is i don't know what this is i don't know what, is. I don't know what that is i don't know what that is um there was another reason and that's because his ideas were being built on previous scientific work this wasn't just completely outside the box this was he was building on others um ideas built on previous science previous science cool it wasn't just like out of the blue it wasn't just boom i've got a new idea it, it was i've just made it better than anyone else because i'm awesome i don't know i, I don't get it DJ HSBD, I don't get it. I don't get it. I'm old, guys. Come on. I am old. Uh, next, what method? It's nice at this point to drop into salt. So you guys are all going to laugh at me. <laughs> I hate being old. Um, what methods would you use to separate the following mixtures? Separating water from seawater. Right, we want, guys, need to stress this. We want the water. So we're going to do fractional distillation. Fractional distillation. Uh, some people might say, can I use simple? You really wouldn't want to do that. Uh, the reason why you wouldn't want to do it is simple distillation will separate water and salt to about an 85, 90% separation. So there'll still be about 10% of the salt left in the water. Well, I don't know about you guys, but I really don't want to, uh, I really don't want to be drinking salty water. So um, uh, I'm gonna separate it as pure as I can using fractional. Next, octane from a mixture of pentane and oxa, an, an octane, they are miscible liquids. Oh, right, interesting. Okay, so in this case, we want to separate out the higher boiling point from the lower. That's interesting. Um, again, we're going to use fractional distillation. They're going to say that they want to use just the normal distillation for the first one. Don't agree. Once again, another fractional disc. If you ever have two oils, they are miscible, which means the oils can mix. That's another frac disc. Sodium nitrate from sodium nitrate and water. Now, we don't want the water this time. We now want the salt. So what we're now going to use is for edXL, it is crystallization. Crystallization, not evaporation. edXL don't like evaporation. I'm, a, I'm just going to move on. I'm not going to ignore all those crazy chats. Petrol, from a mixture of petrol and water, they are immiscible. Oh, that's clever. So the petrol is going to be on top of the water. Oh, Guys, we're going to be using what's called a separating funnel. That's tricky. Ooh, you could just say decant. Uh, just to tell you what a separating funnel is. So if you've got two oil, if you've got two liquids, whoa, that's how long it's taken my laptop to process this. So if I have two liquids that are immiscible, they're going to look like that. The water's going to be here. The water's there and the petrol is there, and they're immiscible. By the way, if you're wondering why, it's because the density of petrol is about 0 0.78 grams per centimeter cubed. That's its density, it's mass per volume. Petrol, uh, water is one gram per centimeter cubed, which means the less dense will float on the more dense. So how do you separate this? What you do is you put this into what's called a separating funnel. The separating funnel, it's got a tap, there and what you just do what you simply do is because it's in a 
this funnel, you turn the tap on, you open tap, and you drain out the liquids. Yeah, it's quite a long thing. Sometimes you also get uh, separating funnels that look like this. Sometimes you get separating funnels that look like this. Like that. Tap. It goes very narrow at the end, by the way. Uh, <clears throat> the reason being is, obviously, as you approach the bottom, it gets narrow. What that means is the narrow bit, of same with a burette, the narrow it is, the faster the volume height will drop. Yeah. So sometimes you see them like that, but you need a separating funnel and you'll just drain off the bottom layer. Next. How do you separate calcium carbonate from a mixture of water? Filtration. That's a separating funnel. Separating funnel. You could probably also say decant. Uh, this one's going to be filtration. We want a solid from a solution. And look, it says filtration. It says insoluble. Yeah. Cool. I think that brings us to the end of the worksheet, which is amazing. And guys, I think that worksheet was actually a really nice worksheet to do. I'm actually not gonna, I'm not gonna do my uh, energetics thing today. What I'm gonna do is, I had energetics questions all lined up, which are here, um, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna leave it there today. I thought that was a really lovely bit of revision. It kind of ticked so many boxes, and I was really, really pleased with that as a worksheet. Um, I'm gonna bring you back, so I'm gonna end the lesson there. I think it's been a really reasonable amount of time. So let's see if I can go back to this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to turn back on my camera, see if I can do that, and then say my goodbyes. Next, I'll set another homework on the classroom, guys. I'll, once again, by the way, did you notice that I picked, I picked revision sheet two, I think, there? I think that was revision sheet two. Is revision sheet four? I kind of went through them and found the one that I liked. Um, I'm just going to reactivate my camera. My screen, amazingly, has not shaked which is amazing. Right, that come back online. See how long this takes to re-enable it. Uh-oh, uh-oh, it's thinking about it. Let's, uh, oh, there we go. Camera's back online. So now let's see if I can go and then add back to stream. Is it gonna work? Oh, it's not gonna give me my, my camera. Start camera. Hey, I'm back. Whoop, whoop. Yay, there we go. I, I really enjoyed this lesson today, folks. I thought it went really well. Um, thanks for coming along. I hope you guys all have a nice rest of your day. Uh, take care of yourself. Stay safe. I'll post another revision worksheet. If you'd like me to do energetics, just send me an email, uh, and I will happily do that instead of doing a worksheet review. But either way, in fact, maybe I'll post, I'm going to post an energetics worksheet. Guys, have a great rest of your day and look after yourselves. It is awesome to see you all. Take care. Bye now.